So I think uh, we can gen, gen, now start with uh, Kay Ue Aman from Pionix. So Kay will uh, discuss about open hardware and software for EV chargers. So let's hear more from him now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the Everest project and how you can use it to build your own uh, vehicle chargers um, with some hardware designs that I will also present to you. Um, first, a few words about myself. Um, I'm Kai, I have a background in computer science and robotics and I've been working at Pionix uh, on the Everest project for uh, over two years now. Um, here's a short overview of the talk. Um, first, I'm going to give you a rough overview of how electric vehicle charging works. Um, this will be followed by an introduction to, to Everest. Then I'm going to show you the open hardware designs, the Yeti and the Yak board and how you can use them to build an AC charger, but also how you can kind of abuse them to build a DIY um, DC charger. And in the end, I will conclude with a short how-to, how you can integrate your own custom hardware into Everest to use it as a charger. So let's um, dive right in. What's needed to um, get a car charging? You obviously need some form of connection between the car and the charging station. This needs some form of a data link and a power link. Here in Europe, we have uh, standardized on the CCS type two combo plug um, for DC charging. Uh, and in other parts of the world, you have different physical connectors that can also be electrically different. And speaking of the electrical side of things, um, you can do obviously AC charging. You can do it with different voltages. For example, if you're in the US, you're probably doing one phase AC charging with 110 volts. And here in Europe, you do it with up to uh, three phases at 230 volts. Um, you can also do DC charging at different voltages and uh, currents. Here it's totally dependent on what the car's battery actually wants. And there are different communication standards uh, specified for AC and uh, DC charging. Let's uh, focus on AC charging first. Um, right now, almost every AC charger out there uses a super simple PWM uh, signal to exchange uh, if the car is plugged in and requests power and from the charging station side uh, to encode the amount of current that the car can draw. And this PWM signal is transmitted over the uh, control pilot wire in the plug. DC charging, on the other hand, is a bit more complex. Um, here you have the uh, Dienspec 71 to 1, which is mostly used for DC charging right now. There's uh, Chademo, which uses CAN as its uh, signal layer, but that is mainly used in Asia. And then there's the uh, ISO 1511-8. Um, the ISO 1511-8 uh, specifies communication using power line communication. Um, it is a communication standard for uh, DC as well as AC charging and you can get a lot more interesting information from the vehicle from the charger side. For example, things like the state of charge of the battery or how long it will take to charge up to like 80% or 100%. Um, the ISO 1511A, especially like the Dash 2, has been around for quite a few years now, but it hasn't really been used in that many cars and chargers up until now. The reason for that is, is uh, quite a complex standard and a uh, fork of the ISO 1511-8 in form of the DINSPEC was available quite early on. Um, but things are changing quite quickly here uh, with the introduction of the ISO 1511-8-20 and the focus on bi-directional power transfer. Um, more interest from manufacturers uh, is coming and we can definitely see that in the industry right now. So, how do you actually charge a car? I would categorize it broadly in three categories. You have the basic AC charging, you know, when you're at home, um, you might have some form of a portable charger that you can just plug into your wall socket, or you have a wall-mounted charger with up to like 11 or even 22 kilowatts. Um, and the same kinds of chargers you can also find in a more ruggedized uh, casing in the public, which are the slow AC chargers, uh, you, know, you just plug your car in and 
leave it for a few hours and come back. And uh, then you have the smart AC charging, which not a lot of cars uh, support that yet. This is uh, using the i711-8, and uh, the, I guess, most prominent feature here would be uh, plug and charge, which is simplified. Uh, yeah, it's a better or more secure way of authenticating a charging session with the backend systems. What might be interesting here and what's upcoming is uh, bi-directional AC charging, where you can use your car as a, as a battery and return you know, electricity back into the grid. Um, yeah. And then we have DC charging, as I've already mentioned, with the Dienstberg and the ISO. Um, this is what you typically see uh, near the highway, the big fast chargers. Um, but there's also smaller units uh, for home use coming up um, that you know, make use of the, uh, of the fact that you don't have that many conversion losses if you do uh, DC-DC conversions and then use it maybe, you know, your car as a buffer battery or you know, as, a, as a house battery. So now that we kind of know uh, what charging is, it can't really be that hard, can it? Um, but unfortunately, there's still lots of, of issues with like, either broken chargers with software bugs in them or even electric vehicles that have software bugs that don't get patched in time. Um, I mean, things are definitely improving there with over-the-air update capabilities, but um, you still have issues. And yeah, this usually problems here come from the high uh, complexity of the involved standards. And because there's a lot of you know, companies and manufacturers involved, the interoperability between implementations can also be a bit uh, problematic. Um, yeah, now let's have a quick look at the uh, a part of the technical ecosystem that has evolved around uh, EV charging in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, you obviously have a lot of you know, functionality. You have a lot of manufacturers, operators in the, for the backend systems involved and lots of protocols and standards. You have the electric vehicle side of things. You have the charging station. You have uh, backend systems that then have to use roaming protocols to talk to other backend systems. Um, you might have energy management systems involved or even grid operators if you're a big uh, charging parks. So as you can see, there's a lot of interaction between different actors and this is what makes it quite complex. But luckily for you, <laughs> we'll only focus on the part that I've encircled in red here, the communication between the electric vehicle and the charging station. So let's uh, talk how the basic PWM charging um, works. You have this control pilot signal. It's a simple plus minus 12 volt uh, signal and the car can lower the positive part of the signal by adding resistors to it um, to signal different states to the charging station. If it lowers it to nine volts, it says that the car is connected. If it lowers it to six volts, uh, it says that it wants to charge and that's pretty much it. There's a few other voltages that you can set, but uh, those are the two that you typically only need. And since it's a PWM signal, uh, the charger can then use the duty cycle to encode the available current, uh, which typically goes between like 6 and 32 amps, at least here in, in Europe. And then we have the uh, high-level charging. This is uh, using a power line communication on top of this uh, control pilot signal, uses the same wire and uses the uh, home plug uh, green fire standard. And how this roughly works is uh, that a logical network between the, um, the charger, the electrical vehicles uh, supply equipment, um, and the car is set up using Slack. Then um, IPv6 addresses are assigned on both sides. The car then sends UDP broadcasts and waits for a charger to reply with its IP address and port number. Then the car opens a TCP TLS connection to the charger and starts speaking uh, ISO 1511.8 on that connection. And that protocol is an XML-based protocol that is then uh, encoded in a binary representation um, called XE, which makes it relatively small to transfer. Now let's talk about Everest. Um, 
It's a complete software stack for electric vehicle chargers. It runs on uh, Linux. It is Apache 2.0 licensed and available on many different hardware platforms. It includes a rich collection of modules and all the domains that you need for uh, charging. It contains the charging logic and protocol implementations for the relevant protocols. Um, there's hardware drivers for things like um, charging hardware, but also power meters. Um, there's an energy management uh, included, authorization system, and simulation facilities to actually test all of this. Um, it's built with a modular architecture, with modules that communicate with each other over MQTT. And there's even a graphical setup user interface that you can see here uh, to configure the connections between these modules. You can also use this configuration interface to set up the uh, energy management uh, as well. And now I would like to dive a little bit deeper into how the framework behind Everest works. Um, as I've already mentioned, it's a modular architecture. You can kind of think of it like a microservices architecture where each module runs in a separate uh, Linux process. Um, and these modules can expose uh, interfaces on this MQTT bus and other modules can then require these interfaces and call functions uh, on the other module or receive data that they are subscribed to. Let's uh, visualize that uh, really quickly. Uh, let's assume we have two modules, module A and module B and module A provides an interface that I would call charger. This interface uh, defines a command, the set max current and a variable, the int charged. Um, Module B can then require this interface, and if you then connect these modules in a config file together, uh, module B can call the commands of module A and uh, get, if it subscribes to the energy charged variable, it will get um, that, the value of that uh, yeah, variable over MQTT. This all happens completely transparent to the module. The module doesn't even know that MQTT is involved. Um, yeah, and this is kind of how it looks like uh, in the yeah, configuration files. We have the, the charger YAML on the left side. This is the interface that uh, describes this command and the, the variable. Then we have uh, the manifest file of module A where we say that it provides this, uh, this charger interface. Then the manifest of module B uh, says that it requires the interface and it requires exactly one kind of module that provides this interface. And then on the right we have a configuration file that sets up the connection between these modules. And you know, that's not where it stops. Uh, we have uh, also other features, things like software and hardware in the loop um, simulation, and we implement lots of uh, relevant protocols. Things like uh, OCPP 1.6 is pretty much completely implemented and working hard with, um, yeah, on the implementation of 2.0.1 and also on the draft of the 2.1 that's just been like, released a few days ago. Uh, then we have ISO 15.11.8 with AC and DC support, DeanSpec, uh, support for the PWM charging, obviously. Um, yeah, we have uh, support for Modbus-based power meters, SunSpec devices, and other things that can talk MQTT. And if you want to write your own modules, we have multiple language bindings for C++, for, for Python, and um, for JavaScript. One of the goals behind Everest was always that it's easily portable to new hardware, um, which means that the interfaces are you know, relatively small, I would say, that you have to implement. And porting to a new hardware usually means that you need um, some form of device driver that can get the control pilot signal events uh, and generate the PWM signal and as a minimum drive the relays that yeah, make uh, actually electricity flow to the car. Um, everything else is more or less optional. You, you don't need a power meter if you don't need it, if you don't care about uh, you know, what your RCD reports. I mean, you need it electrically, but you don't need to write a driver for it if, you don't, if you're not interested in the leakage currents. And if you don't want to do any authentication, you don't need RFID readers or any form of human interface device. 
Um, there's also a few deeply integrated hardware reference designs uh, already available. The Pionix CAT and YAC open hardware is based around the Raspberry Pi 4 uh, compute module. There's also hardware from uh, Texas Instruments and Phytech uh, based on the AM62X. And ChargeByte has a controller, I think it's called the Terragon controller. That's, I think, based on an MX, NXP uh, controller. It's mostly, like, the OS support is also quite good. I mean, we have layers that work with uh, at least Dunfell and Kirkstone. Might have also gotten it to work already on, on FUD, which is ancient by now, I think. So let's uh, talk about the open hardware. First of all, the most important thing, you can find the designs here on GitHub. It's released under the CERN open hardware license version 2. And the idea behind these designs was always to be yeah, as developer friendly as possible. So the designs are obviously not optimized for cost, but for features. So you can play around, do a lot of interesting things with it. It's been designed in uh, KiCad 6, and there's also some case design files available. Now, if you want to build uh, some form of an AC charger, you're quite lucky that it's quite easy because you don't need to build a, a battery charger where you can ac where you actually have to talk to the uh, battery and set cor correct voltages and things like that. Um, you pretty much just have to build a smart relay. Uh, yeah. Optionally, uh, no, not, not optionally, but you, um, yeah, optionally you can add a power meter and you need to add an RCD for safety and a microcontroller to create the PWM states and, and read them back. And if you want to do some more advanced things, um, you can add a Linux board on top. Here you can see this uh, YT 22 kilowatt AC uh, three phase um, power board that we've uh, designed. It comes with, uh, <coughs> comes with a lot of features. Uh, like I already mentioned, it does control pilot signal generation. It can do the sync, uh, signal sampling back in sync with this PWM. Um, has an onboard relay for three phase power switching. We have um, also three phase power metering with up to eight kilohertz. So you can measure voltages, currents, power frequency of all the phases plus the neutral. There's an RCD module that gives you the measured uh, leakage current back for telemetry, which can be quite interesting because some cars actually produce a considerable amount of leakage. Um, then <coughs> we added a 10-pin connector with a UART um, that does the connection to the um, YAC high-level control board. There's connections to an SPI LCD. If you just want to run the Yeti board, it's also possible. And external GPIOs, and um, obviously it has an onboard uh, power supply where you can run it from 110 volts to 230 volts. The uh, microcontroller on board is an STM32. And the firmware for that is also uh, publicly available under the Apache 2.0 license. It um, obviously controls all the devices on the CT board and has electrical safety relevant code encapsulated and does all the communication with Everest over a protocol using protobuf over the UART. Here's um, how you can use this uh, Yeti board then. You can either use it as a standalone charger or as the power path for a smart charger, and you can implement some form of uh, automatic switching. If you detect that your high-level Linux board fails, you can still go back to the standalone charger mode um, if you want to provide free charging, for example. If um, you want to use it as a standalone charger, it's quite easy. You just plug it in and it works, uh, and it can then use the UART to observe the charging uh, session. You see the, the events that are they're called, and uh, you have some limited control over the session. You can pause it, you can resume it. But you can also put the firmware in the low-level control mode with a simple UART command, and here you then have to provide all the charging logic externally. Only the, the basic state machine remains in the microcontroller, and um, you can set the PWM signal then 
from an external board and read back these events. And this is the mode we use in Everest to enable things like high level charging using the ISO and the Dean spec. And to make this work, we've designed this uh, high level control board um, that yeah, runs on Linux. It has a, yeah, like I already mentioned, a Raspberry Pi compute module 4 on board, this 10 pin connector for connection of the Yeti. There's a real time clock uh, with a backup battery included, uh, power line uh, communication modem for uh, high level communication with the car. Uh, for convenience, we added a connector for popular RFID modules. We have uh, yeah, canvas, Ethernet, USB ports, external GPIOs, uh, yeah, lots of things. And here's pretty much how you would put it together. Um, you put a type 2 connector on the left side, plug it into the Yeti board, stack the yak on board, and just uh, wire it up with a mains free phase power, and you're pretty much um, good to go. And if you want to do something a little bit more interesting, if you, you know, paid attention the last couple of minutes, you probably uh, noticed that the yak comes uh, already prepared with everything that you need for, for DC communication because the DC communication just uses the power line communication. So uh, we kind of repurposed these uh, both boards um, to build our own DIY DC charger. You can see a uh, diagram here where we used uh, the YAC uh, connected via a CAN to a power supply and via Modbus to an isolation monitor and used the Yeti's uh, relays to switch some DC contactors. And this is uh, how it looks like in, in reality. Like on the left side, uh, you see an image where on the top you have basically the AC input side and the DC contactors with the Yeti and the Yak board. And on the bottom, you have a like 19 inch uh, 30 kilowatt uh, DC power supply um, that we gotten for cheap off the internet. And um, yeah, on the right, you can see the, the Yeti board being used to switch the DC contactors. Obviously, you don't need to use a Yeti board, but I mean, you just have a few of them lying around. And I mean, this is probably the least exciting uh, photo in this whole presentation because successful charging isn't really that uh, easily photographed. Um, but <laughs> you just have to trust me um, that we've already gotten it uh, to work with a uh, with a Skoda Enyaq, and um, yeah, it works already quite well. And we've been, we're going to be working on that a little bit more over the coming uh, weeks and months and give an update on that as well. So, now uh, if you want to build uh, your own board support package for an Everest uh, powered charger, I give you a quick example. Uh, using the, the Yeti driver as, uh, as the base. Um, you can see the whole, I think, manifest of the uh, Yeti driver and um, don't really have to pay too much attention to the top part of the config, but only what it um, provides in the bottom. It provides a power meter because it's already on board, but it also provides this board support uh, AC interface. And this is literally on the only thing that you need to implement to get a to get a AC charger working with Everest. Uh, you know, short overview, the condensed version of the interface, uh, you literally just have to implement a very small set of commands. You have to you know, return the hardware capabilities, you know, the minimum, maximum current that you support and the number of phases. You have to be able to enable and disable um, the charger. Um, we need, obviously need P PWM control, so we need to set the duty cycle and turn it off and on again. We need some form of signal to signal to the charger that it is now allowed to switch the relays on. And if you have a detachable cable on your charging uh, station, you also have to return the current carrying capacity of the cable. And then there's only a few variables. The most important of these is the events variable where you just have to report back uh, the control pilot events, things like that the car has plugged in, that the car has requested power, 
that the car is requested to stop power and the car has unplugged, which you can directly infer from the voltages that you read on the control pilot. <laughs> and if you've now uh, implemented your uh, board support package driver, um, you can then hook it up with our you know, web-based uh, tool to yeah, pretty much connect it to everything else. We, uh, we now start with the, the Yeti driver here on, on the bottom and we add uh, what we call the EVSE manager to it. This is a very central module in, in Everest that represents a charging connector and has all the charging logic and session management uh, included in it and a few other things. And this module is what we use to uh, orchestrate the access to this one connector. So it's more or less like owned by the EVSE manager. Then that we can actually have some uh, energy flowing through the system. We need to add an energy manager which uh, is responsible for the distribution of the available power. Um, with one driver and one connector this is not particularly exciting but if you have multiple of them uh, connected and you can't use all of them at uh, you know, full capacity or you would blow your fuse to, um, to the grid, then you can use this energy management system to set uh, certain hardware limitations, um, but you can also use it to hook it up to OCPP, for example, and use uh, OCPP's smart charging features to set certain profiles that either yeah, are for the whole station or just for this one charging, uh, charging session. Optionally, you can add an uh, IC1511.8 uh, protocol stack and a Slack module. Here you obviously need a driver for your power line communication uh, modem, but since there's not too many companies around that uh, make these, um, I think the Linux driver support is already quite uh, decent here and they just expose an Ethernet device that you can just uh, use with these stacks and uh, they, they do all the work here then. And if you then want to do it as a you know, public charging station, you, you add some authorization uh, on top of it uh, in form of an RFID reader. Uh, you just read your RFID card and this authorization module um, is then connected to the EVSE manager and validates if the card was valid. It can also connect to things like OCVP to do authentication there and, and it uh, you know, validates all the requests and uh, reports back to um, the EVs e manager. All right, if that was you know, interesting for you, um, here's how you can get involved. You can uh, check out the code on, on GitHub. Um, you can also look at the hardware designs and uh, microcontroller firmware that you can also find on GitHub. We have a mailing list where we try to be relatively responsive uh, and you can ask all sorts of uh, questions related to Everest there. Um, we have a quick start guide and some tutorials on how you can set up the simulation, how you can add uh, OCPP to Everest uh, if you want to develop new modules um, and more. Um, we then ha also have a technical steering committee meeting uh, once a month, every fourth uh, Thursday of the month, um, where we talk about yeah what uh, what we did in the last month and you know. Uh, talk about what went into our new monthly releases. We, we try to adhere to a roughly monthly uh, release uh, schedule right now and if you can't make it to that, uh, to that meeting, uh, the recordings are available on YouTube relatively shortly uh, afterwards. And if you want to get really involved, you can join our developer meetings uh, that happen every Tuesday between 3 and 4 p.m. Central European Summertime and the meeting link for that you can also find on our mailing list. Thank you very much. All right, we thank you, Kai. We've got time for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free, yeah. <clears throat> hey, thanks for the talk, it's a really cool project. 
Uh, I want to ask, like, there's a lot of certifications involved in building a hard char EV charger. Is there any products that have went through certification that are using the open source hardware? Um, we have one product right now that uh, is more like a business-to-business -business product, like a test equipment that you can use to validate ISO 15.11.8 uh, with. Uh, that went through CE certification, uh, at least. Um, and yeah, we're we're working. I, I'm not sure about the hardware designs. Pretty sure the the charge pad controller. This is widely uh, deployed. Not not with Everest widely deployed, but it is available with Everest from charge pad. Um, and this is obviously certified because it's running in um, commercial installations already. Um, not sure about the TI Fighter hardware, but uh, probably uh, certifiable as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks from from my side as well. Um, uh, there are at least two other open source hardware projects focusing on EV chargers. There's one uh, called Open EVSE, and uh, I've seen uh, one on the Beagle board uh, booth uh, together with Seed Studio. Can you uh, state how the differences between these projects are, and uh, if you collaborate somehow or use similar components? I'm I'm not completely familiar with, with their hardware designs, um, so I can't say uh, too much about them. Um, but what differentiates us, I'd say, is um, that we you know, focus on uh, not making a, a small like microcontroller-based uh, easy AC charger, but um, we've already built this with, with like DC charging and more complex uh, things in mind where you just need a little bit more compute power. Pretty sure you can do all of this in a microcontroller as well, um, but for some applications, it's it's much easier to to use a, a Linux-based board. And I think most of the other open hardware designs I've seen focused on a microcontroller-based approach, and this is, in my opinion, a bit more more extendable. Um, but yeah, there should definitely be a little bit more collaboration. Maybe I'll drop by later and say hello and ask it. Okay, thanks. Hi, and thank you. Um, about the um, ISO 15.11.8 uh, implementation, is still based on Java Rise V2G, or uh, you made some? We, uh, we actually have three stacks uh, available right now. Um, one of the options is uh, the, the Rise V2G with Java. Then we have the, uh, the Joseph uh, Community Edition as a backend available, but we also have a module that has been donated to us by, by Chargebyte, which um, is written in C++ and C, and uses uh, OpenV2G as its backend. But as a fourth option, we are also working on a complete own implementation uh, of the i 11.8, especially the, the Dash 2, but then also the Dash 20, um, just to have it uh, in a more compatible license because the, the open V2G is LGPL3, which is problematic for some <laughs> vendors that want to do, uh, want to work with it. Some of them, you know, they, they, they read GPL and they run away sometimes. Um, so we want to write an implementation of our own or actually are working on an implementation of our own that will be Apache 2.0 license. Um, but yeah, this, these are the three stacks available right now and they've, had, they've been quite well tested already on different testing events and work relatively well, I'd say. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, thanks for the presentation. I got a question uh, in regards to the uh, control pilot. It's embedded in some of the modules that you presented on the presentation? Um, yeah, what we actually do is uh, we do the whole control pilot um, reading and generation, we do this in the, in the microcontroller firmware. Like, uh, we read out uh, the, um, yeah, we, we read out the positive part drop, uh, voltage drop of the, of the car. Um, so we, we, we read out it, that the car is connected and that it wants to request power, but we also generate the PWM signal in the microcontroller. Um, but there's not, at least one board um, that we're running on um, that does all of that pretty much in, in Linux. Um, and that also works relatively well, I'd say. Um, so I hope that was your question. I'm not sure. Uh, 
No, actually, I was asking about the, the, the modules that you presented and on the, on the Everest project, whether who's actually responsible for the, wh which of the module is responsible for generating and signaling the PWM to the car? Well, it's, uh, it's the, the YT driver, which is responsible for doing like the, the high-level signaling to the car, but the microcontroller code in, in the microcontroller on the YT board is then responsible to actually set the, the PWM to its correct uh, duty cycle and to read back um, the events there. Okay, and uh, yet another question about the, actually referring to, to, the, uh, to the ISO 1511.8, uh, what's the rationale about having multiple options for the ISO 1511.8 as a module? It's um, mostly um, getting results quickly. That's we, we started this project like two and a half years ago, and back then we, we, we personally didn't have anything, so we uh, tried to find other um, uh, implementations out there. So we, we started with the, with the RISE V2G, worked a little bit with that, saw you know, its drawbacks, things like Java and things like that. Um, then last year the, the Joseph uh, Community Edition was uh, released, but then we were already working on our own uh, solution. Um, but we are also interested in, to see how that works, and it's not that he's, uh, not that hard to integrate it within, uh, within Everest, especially since we have like Python module support. It's not um, that hard. And um, the, the third stack that was actually donated to the project uh, from Chargebyte as a contributor, um, so they had that stack. It was uh, battle tested over the last couple of years. Uh, supports uh, the Dean spec as well, and uh, so we integrated it and um, are, are quite happy with it right now, but we're still working on our own solution because we think we can do it maybe a little bit more integrated in, in Everest. I think we have time for last question. Okay, thank you, Kai. So it, now we're gonna have a short break uh, until uh, 11 a.m. So it's time for coffee. Thanks, thanks again. Thank you very much. <laughs>